We're going to skip our break and just move right on to the next panel so we stay on time. I'd like to introduce our panelists for the third session. We've got Bob Katnack, who's a partner at Dorsey and practices in cybersecurity data breach response. Um, Bob spearheaded the Sedona Conference's publication of a highly acclaimed incident response guide recently and has been very involved in helping companies develop um, and prepare for in security incidents. Jennifer Coates is a partner at Dorsey and is a litigator, former assistant at Attorney General with the Office of the Minnesota Attorney General, and she's advised state regulatory agencies on data privacy issues as part of that role. Thank you for joining us, Jennifer. And we've got Deborah Howitt, who's a partner and practices in the data privacy, cybersecurity, and intellectual property transactions areas, including data breach response, policy work, and Deb was a former general counsel to a digital media company, so understands these issues from both the outside counsel and inside counsel perspective. So welcome, everybody. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jamie, uh, and good morning to all. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the patience with us as we get through these. It, I, I've never really done speed dating, but I, I think this is kind of what it would be like. Um, so we're going to go through a few things this morning. Uh, one of the one of the topical areas that we're seeing as we as we practice throughout these uh, spheres, uh, just very brief, high level. You know, ransomware is not going away. Uh, it it will ebb and flow. Um, my prediction with the world events, it's going to be uh, a lot of flow right now. Uh, just a couple of highlights. The cyber criminals are, are always one step ahead. They're finding new vulnerabilities um, as they explore uh, the supply chain. They're finding new ways to exploit these vulnerabilities. And uh, they're, they are finding more ways to pressure companies to paying the ransom. We're gonna talk in a little bit more detail uh, about that later. But I would also like to note that business email compromise or BEC remains the biggest economic threat from criminal activity. Um, and fortunately, I think the law enforcement, particularly federal law enforcement, the FBI, are finding ways to, to assist companies in dealing with this. For example, they've got financial kill chains both domestically and internationally, so they can maybe claw back stolen, some of the stolen money. If we could have the next slide, please. Um, and Deb's going to talk later about some of the particulars of this, but I think what we're seeing is the, the squeeze has become particularly acute for medium to smaller size companies. There was a piece in yesterday's Wall Street Journal that said the cyber criminals are now looking at private equity acquisitions of small to medium sized companies and focusing, they, they, they follow the deals because they think they're, now there's going to be deep pockets and some of these smaller to medium sized companies may not have the robustness, so they don't have the resources. Um, and oftentimes they're faced, it, faced with a take it or leave a contract terms from their business partners and vendors. Um, and Deb is gonna talk later about some, some benchmarks we can find, but right now, uh, Deb, would, would you like to, next slide please, um, give us uh, your, your thoughts on, you know, where's the bar these days on reasonable security? Yes, absolutely, thanks, Bob. Um, so, it's fortunate that many of the legislators who have created these bills and laws understand that it's reasonable to hold different standards for a small local company versus a large multinational company. Or there's different resources available to the companies, different number of employees, um, different volume of data. You know, there's a lot of nuances. And so most of the laws that we're um, faced with, there were you know, numerous flaws in different states, but the majority of them focus on having reasonable security measures in place. And so what is reasonable, right? That can change over time. Technology changes over time, the risks change over time, the threat actors evolve and become more sophisticated over time and we need to keep up. And so reasonability varies. Um, but I'll talk for a minute here about some basic security measures that small and medium sized businesses really should implement to be in line with those reasonable standards. And some of these are described in um, different laws and different frameworks and, and different guidance that I'll talk a little bit more about. 
So having a written information security program is key. Um, you know, it's not enough to sort of just do the practices, but you need to have it in writing. You know, one reason is to prove to regulators, if you're ever investigated, that you do have this program in place and to ensure that everybody within the company understands what the program is and is on board and really have documented policies and procedures describing your security measures. Um, second, it's important to implement administrative, technical, and physical safeguards to protect personal data and other confidential information from unauthorized access, modification, deletion, destruction, exfiltration. Um, so, you know, those three types of measures, administrative might be um, examples of, you know, limiting access to certain people, you know, thinking about who within the company really needs to access the data. Technical measures might be something such as encryption. And physical measures could be as simple as locking paper files in a file cabinet or you know, having a cable securing a laptop to your desk, that type of thing. Designating a point person to spearhead the security program is also very important. If you don't designate somebody, then it's not clear who's responsible and, and things just don't seem to get done. Managing relationships with service providers is also extremely important. And um, I'll talk more about that in a few slides. Having an incident response plan that's sort of the roadmap of um, describing what you should do in the event of a security breach, um, actual or suspected, is also important. And then there's other basic safeguards, such as having user authentication protocols, access control measures, encryption I already mentioned, um, just ensuring that, that data is secured at, at various times. Um, you can keep it on the same slide right now <laughs> still, sorry. Um, and then also there are different security frameworks. So I have on the slide here reference NIST, ISO, and CIS. Those are just a few. And then there are also variations between um, there's the NIST cybersecurity framework, there's other NIST frameworks, there's different ISO variations. And some of those frameworks are extremely robust, you know, maybe a little bit challenging for some smaller clients to comply with. Um, some of my clients have actually created their own framework that's sort of a subset of NIST. Um, certain entities you know, will be required to comply with certain frameworks. Um, and I just wanna talk uh, for a minute about the CIS framework. Um, that's the uh, critical security controls. These are 20 controls that were developed to provide a smaller prioritized number of actionable controls that should be implemented first to yield immediate results. So you know, this seems potentially more manageable for smaller companies, mid-sized companies, or, or companies even of a larger size who are sort of just getting started and you know, really don't know where to begin. You know, again, these are, are very um, immediate results from these. And when you read them, they seem sort of um, obvious in some ways, but they can be challenging to implement, um, as I've seen with many of my clients, such as creating an inventory of all your hardware and software assets, limiting administrative privileges within your IT environment, maintaining security configurations and settings, um, analyzing your IT event log, making sure you train your people, having an inventory of your data, um, and there's a lot of them, and, and um, if you'd like a copy of that framework as a good starting point, I'm happy to send it to you. Just shoot me an email. Um, and then most of the measures that I just described um, as important for smaller companies are actually listed within the Massachusetts law. As I mentioned, most, most states simply say reasonable security. Massachusetts goes a step further, and they actually list specific measures within their law. They also require in their law that companies have a written information security plan, and um, they have details of what that needs to include. So anybody processing Massachusetts data needs to have that in place. California in 2016 published um, the data breach report um, that was published by Kamala Harris when she was attorney general there. And in that report, although California's law mentions reasonable security, the report specifically cites the CIS critical security controls, those 20 controls I, I just mentioned and describes those as being reasonable security. Next slide, please. So in Colorado, um, which is where I am located in the Denver office of Dorsey, 
our um, law also requires reasonable security, and uh, it's helpful to hear from your regulators. So as Jamie mentioned in the first panel, um, our Attorney General Phil Weiser recently, just a few weeks ago, um, gave a speech, and it's also available um, in writing, describing what Colorado considers to be reasonable security. And so I thought that guidance was pretty helpful. You know, different states have published different guidance as well. but. You know, some of these will sound familiar, as I just described within the CIS controls and, and Massachusetts and some of the other reasonable requirements. So inventory your data, understand what data you have, where is it located? And um, you know, this is also critical to do for privacy purposes, to be able to describe that in your privacy notice, you need to inventory it and know what it is. Um, second, also know how that data is secured, how it's accessed throughout its life cycle, and delete the data when it's no longer needed. That's a requirement in the laws of Colorado and some other states as well. So think about, do you really need to keep this around for 20 years? You know, If not, it shouldn't be hanging around so it can be breached, right? Delete it. Um, have a written information security policy. Um, some of the details that um, our attorney general has described that should be in there and within your security program include Multi-factor authentication, you know, that's a key way of preventing the business email compromise that Bob mentioned, um, using endpoint detection to look for malicious activity on your network, responding and addressing um, any malicious activity that you find, encrypting sensitive data, um, utilizing a security team and having a, a point person as the individual. Um, Having an incident response plan, as I mentioned, to understand what everybody within your company should do if you suspect an incident. Managing vendor security, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next few slides, um, including requirements under Colorado law and the laws of several other states, having a contract requiring the vendor to have reasonable security measures in place, having uh, cybersecurity training for your employees, um, last summer, uh, our government also mentioned some specific guidance with regard to ransomware, and um, you know that includes, for example, having robust backups. You know, if you're hit with ransomware, if you can just spin up your backup and start with that, you don't need to pay the ransom. Next slide, please. Yeah, I, I, what is helpful, I think, uh, to put this in context is. We all live in a commercial as well as a regulated world. And I'm gonna guess that just about everybody attending this has in one way or another seen the effects of the sort of supply chain focus. Um, maybe just a bit, bit of context. Several years ago, the Office of, Office of the Comptroller of Currency said to financial institutions, you must start looking at your third party vendors and your third party vendors looking at their vendors, et cetera. So it's not just a focus on an institution, but on the supply chain up and down. And that I think we saw immediately a, a lot more uh, sensitivity to uh, data security uh, in the financial sector that's migrated uh, reasonably effectively to the healthcare sector. And now it's, it's happening, I think, throughout the commercial sector because of the supply chain. So even, even in the absence of someone saying, well, what do I really need to do to comply with the Colorado law, it's my vendors are telling me I have to do this. My customers are telling me I have to do this. So if we could have uh, the next slide, please. I think Deb's gonna talk now a little bit more about um, how, how we do this as a practical matter. Right, absolutely, thanks. So yeah, vendor security is extremely important. So what are some of the options for evaluating and monitoring your vendors and other third-party partners who might have access to your data, might be collecting data on your behalf or, or otherwise processing it for you? Um, so you can ask them if they have any third party audits, you know, if they're trying to adhere to, you know, some of those frameworks I mentioned, they may have an audit or a certification issued by a neutral third party that says that, yes, they are in compliance, in compliance with a specific framework. Um, if they're compliant with PCI data security standards for payment cards, they probably have a QSA report they can show you. So those are examples. Definitely ask for those. 
if, um, if they don't have that, or potentially even in addition, you can create your own questionnaire. We have a template that we share with our clients if you're interested, and um, we can tailor that to your specific company's needs to evaluate a vendor's security and privacy measures up front. And you can do that before you select a vendor and you know, send it out to potentially a few vendors and see how they respond. Um, you can visit their premises, talk to their people. You know, that's a little bit more burdensome, but you know, depending on the nature of the relationship, you may want to go that far. There's also security um, assessment services you can subscribe to that rate various companies um, and, and there's other options. And so who within the company should be responsible for this? It, it depends on your company, but if you're a larger entity, you may have somebody in charge of sourcing or procurement. So it's great to do it at that stage. You know, with the RFP process, they can send out the questionnaire. They can have, um, you know, part of the RFP form that the company needs to send copies of their third party audits or certifications. Um, if it's a strategic alliance, you might have um, whoever's responsible for that partner relationship ask the questions and, and vet them. Or you may have somebody in project management, IT, security departments that is responsible for implementing these relationships, and it's definitely helpful to have them on board. Um, they can also do this along with the um, privacy and security assessment, as um, you know, the first panel mentioned that is a requirement under various laws. And then how do you keep track of all of this? So depending on the software and, and tools that your company may use, you might have a procurement database, you might have a contract management database or system, you might have a GRC tool, um, a data mapping tool. A lot of my clients handle this in different ways. Uh, some of the more sophisticated contract management tools and, and GRC tools will actually automatically send out the questionnaires to your vendors on an annual basis and track who responds and how they respond. And those are, are certainly very helpful. Next slide, please. So um, what do you include in your vendor contract? Um, many states have obligations, as I mentioned, to oversee the vendors, contractually require them to have reasonable security. So that's sort of the you know, low bar that you need to have in there. Um, you can, if they adhere to any specific standards, you can include that in the contract as reps and warranties that yes, they warrant that they will continue to comply with the NIST cybersecurity framework throughout the term of the agreement or PCI DSS or whatever's applicable. Um, if you had them complete the questionnaire and they've um, indicated that they have specific measures in place, you can require that in the contract and specifically list them as well. You may be having some connectivity problems. Start a contract is maybe not reasonable 10 years later. So um, we lost you for a minute there. Oh, no. Um, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? It's okay now. Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so you may want to list some specific measures, potentially encryption, um, or require them to segment your data from the data of their other customers, training of their staff, potentially only have staff who are background checked, um, participate in your relationship. You want to have some terms in there about notifying you if they have a data breach, or even if they suspect a data breach, and you can define that very broadly. And um, certainly require them to assist and promptly investigate, remediate, pay for any cost of notification or credit monitoring or anything that you deem appropriate. And certainly allow for you to audit their security practices. And then in addition, you wanna make sure that your company has a process for onboarding <clears throat> vendors and terminating vendors, making sure their access is truly limited to what they actually need. You know, think about the concept of lease privilege and in terms of setting up that access in those relationships. And um, make sure that your networks and, and your data is also segmented so that you know, they can't inadvertently access all of your data and all of your systems and get into your whole network. And uh, you know, we, we've all heard of that huge target data breach and that occurred in a vendor situation where um, you know, the, there was not proper network segmentation and data segmentation. And also make sure that there's a process in place such that when any vendor relationship is terminated, now the legal department typically knows about this because they're terminating the contracts and some notice. 
And um, there should be a process in place such that the head of security or IT or whoever controls that vendor access is also notified so that they can shut off that vendor's access to your systems. And you know, people think about this with regard to large vendors and, and large relationships with service providers, but it's equally important even with just an independent contractor who's an individual. You know, you may have given them login credentials to some of your systems and, oh, you know them, you trust them, right? But it's equally important to turn off their access as soon as that relationship is done. Next slide, please. Yeah, maybe to, to try to put this in perspective, uh, we've, we've now burdened you with all the stuff you have to do and uh, all the hoops you have to jump through, but there are some, there are some uh, encouraging developments on the horizon um, as, as, uh, as this slide indicates, we won't spend a lot of time on each of the details. We now have three states, uh, uh, Ohio, I think started it, uh, um, and, and then Utah came uh, last year with a very uh, effective, basically a safe harbor. So think this, if you, you take the trouble to go through and, and do what you need to do to tighten and harden your cybersecurity measures and you document that, God forbid the day should come, but it comes um, that you have to uh, establish that, hey, we did everything we could. And we, they still hack this, which is most often the case. That's what I do is 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 data breaches, and you know these are some well prepared companies, but nobody's perfect. But if you look at these um, uh, individual state laws, and, and Deb can jump in here uh, on on some of the particulars, but we won't spend a lot of time on this. The the point is that you take advantage of these these safe harbors because uh, uh, it, it can be an incredibly helpful um, defense against litigation. And as we watch the landscape of states enacting laws uh, on privacy laws, et cetera, I think we're seeing more and more of these in some of the proposed legislation, who knows where they'll end up. But maybe Dev, you could talk high level of, of any of the particulars you think would be helpful for the audience to know. If we still have Dev. Bob, can I jump in and just ask you, what is the yeah. connection there between the safe harbors and what is eventually and what is now happening in the cybersecurity insurance marketplace? And as these bills and uh, possibly are passed or laws um, are passed, how may that affect um, cyber insurance going forward? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, I, these are these are all integrated in some way. You have the commercial sector which is forcing all companies to tighten their security. You have the, the carrot here of the safe harbor, which if you've tightened your security and you can, and you can meet the standards, um, that, that gives you that protection. And then back to the stick side, uh, the cyber carriers are increasingly challenging uh, their insurance to establish that they have not just good, but really good uh, cyber hygiene. Um, and you know, in the interest of, of moving this along, we'll we'll, we'll come in a, in a minute or two to uh, the 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 cyber insurance piece. But Deb, do you, do you want to spend just a couple seconds on some of the some of the highlights of this, if uh, so, the audience can have some context. Sure, absolutely. So yeah, they're slightly different, but but these three are similar. And you know, they started these with the recognition that companies can have excellent cybersecurity in place and still be hacked, right? That's the reality that we live in today, unfortunately. And you know, if they have the excellent cybersecurity, they shouldn't be sued or they shouldn't be subject to punitive damages. So yeah, so you know, they vary a bit in terms of whether it's an affirmative defense to you know the entire lawsuit, specifically tort or contract claims, or or just um, an affirmative defense such that you would not be hit with punitive damages. But generally, these three laws um, recognize if you're in compliance with a recognized framework, um, some of the ones we discussed and as are listed here, now that's reasonable security and. Um, even if you're hacked, which can still happen, even if you're fully in compliance with these frameworks, um, you should be able to get a break, right? So they're generally limited to you know, lawsuits in these specific states subject to those specific state laws, um, you know, and, and there are some limits, but um, Utah goes a little bit further than the others in describing that it also has to be a program with administrative technical physical 
safeguards designed to you know, protect the security confidentiality and the integrity of the data, um, you know, those types of details. So certainly worth reading those if you have a significant amount of personal data in these three states. I would anticipate many other states may follow, but to be determined at this point. And Deb, as we're looking at these um, third party vendors, um, uh, or I'm sorry, looking at mapping out this data, what are your thoughts about um, smaller companies using third party providers for mapping, collecting, and centralizing supplier um, risk management? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, third parties can certainly be helpful. Um, many of my clients don't really have the internal resources to engage in all their data mapping. So you know, we help clients with that, and we have consultants we can recommend as well. Um, and also with regard to just security generally, you know, if you're a tiny company and you're using Amazon Web Services to host your data, right? No one's going to question the security of AWS generally, I, I believe, <laughs> unless and until they have a huge data breach. But you know, it's, it's probably a safer route to take um, if you don't have a lot of internal resources. And, and frankly, even if you do. Great. Um, so segueing a bit to the cyber insurance market, uh, I think it was viewed for a while as sort of a panacea when cybersecurity be became a big uh, uh, blip on the radar screen. Uh, I think the first uh, impulse was, well, let's get some insurance for it. And when there would be C-suite discussions, the risk officer would say, oh, no worries, we got it covered, cyber insurance, taking care of it. Uh, the, those were the good old days. Uh, the market has changed, unfortunately, dramatically, especially in the last 18 months with the tsunami of ransomware attacks. So the, 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 the big picture is that it, coverage is harder to obtain. Uh, the premiums uh, have gone up dramatically, sometimes well over 100%. There are higher self-insured retentions. So the policyholder is gonna have the first hit. Um, and some of these are, are really significant retentions. And then this is a, a newer phenomenon, but it's important to note, carriers are demanding quote co-insurance, which really means, well, all right, so if we're gonna give you $5 million of coverage after your retention, half of that 5 million, you are gonna self-insure. So it, it has dramatically changed uh, the nature of the game uh, of cyber insurance. If we could have the next slide, please. And I think Jennifer may walk us through now some of the underwriting scrutiny that we're now seeing for with our clients. Oh, thank you, Bob. So I, we are seeing a lot more scrutiny and that is obviously due to the deluge of um, claims and, and risk um, um, in breaches. You know, for there were cyber losses, insured losses um, in the tune of 1.8 billion um, in the year 2019. And that's a 50% increase over the previous year. Um, and then comparatively, if you think about, you know, 20% of uh, the of 5 billion um, in the cyber insurance program is, is, is held by a very small amount of companies. And so there's just not the ability to have, for instance, they don't have historical data. Uh, there are not that many players in the uh, game um, with cyber insurance. So it's just it, right now uh, difficult to get just to think about, you know, traditional insurance um, brokerage and how insurance companies work. However, um, going forward with cyber security and cyber insurance, things that people, uh, sorry, the insurance companies are looking for, you know, are certainly the incident response plan. And this goes back to a Deb uh, and Bob were discussing, which is we want to make sure that everything is written out and there's there is a specific plan for how you um, want to respond to data breaches, how you have your data kept, what your security measures are. Um, tabletop exercises are incredibly important. Um, and that is, in, in fact, that is essentially what happens when you run through a scenario as to what happens if, you know, there is a data breach. Um, and so it is important to do that because, you know, frankly, often in our companies, the CEO, the CFO, and the CIO don't necessarily speak the same language. They're not looking at the same issues, the same amount of risk. So it's incredibly important to get those three heads if you will, um, in other stakeholders into the room to make sure that we're all speaking um, the same language. As far as um, security 
uh, policies and specific security measures. Um, certainly that system segregation to prevent horizontal movement, as Deb was saying, is incredibly important. We wanna make sure that people are only getting the data that they um, should be getting. And certainly carriers are looking for that segmentation um, because obviously that goes to risk. Um, <laughs> Bob says here that brokers may be your best friend, but you're you're, you're not their only client. Um, and of course, said tongue in cheek. But you know, the fact of the matter is, you have to make sure that you're shoring up your cybersecurity defenses and your ability to qualify for cybersecurity insurance um, uh, in protecting your own company. So uh, that's something that a broker can certainly opine on, but not necessarily do for you. Yeah, and the and the brokers have they're in a tough spot these days because their customers are scrambling to get coverage. They're their be the, the, the broker's job. They are the agent of the policyholder, so it's their job to advocate for the policyholder. But they've got lots of policyholders, and their credibility is on the line. So when they go back to a carrier and say, we, "You really ought to give a, a hard look at getting the coverage for this company." Uh, the carrier is going to judge that that representation based on the overall, frankly, credibility of the broker. So they they they're, they want to be your advocate, but they've got to be fairly candid. And Deb, I think you've got some uh, next slide, please. Yes. Um, some uh, some some sort of on the on the ground data from from one of the brokers here, I think. Right. Yes. Yeah. So this is from Marsh McLennan and um, this is what they consider to be um, their critical cybersecurity controls that they want to see their clients have. And, you know, I, I, I've held numerous clients with their cyber insurance, and I've seen the questionnaires over the years become increasingly more complex, a lot more details that they want to see. You know, they're, I think the insurers have really learned a lot of lessons in this space. And, um, you know, you can't sort of gloss over some of these issues anymore. You know, you have to have evidence. Another reason to have, you know, written policies, written procedures, written program. Um, so this slide from Marsh describes um, multi-factor authentication. So, you know, as we mentioned, this is a huge way um, to prevent intrusion into your networks by use of a password. And, um, you know, if it has to be multi-factor, they can't just guess the password and the login credentials and get in because a lot of that's on the dark web available for anybody to purchase. Um, they have to also have, you know, a specific device or token or, or some other factor to get in, right? Um, endpoint, endpoint detection and response. You know, we talked about that a little bit, you know, monitoring your endpoints and, and responding when you discover anything. Um, having a process and, and protocol to apply your critical patches in a prompt manner. Um, you know, a lot of breaches happen because someone didn't get around to doing a patch. That was the case in that um, huge um, it, it, uh, Equifax breach, right, a couple of years ago. Um, having secure offline backups, again, that can prevent any issues with ransomware if you just use your backups instead of having to pay the ransom. Um, and, and just to quickly run through the rest, um, just remote desktop protocol, um, ensuring that not exposed outside the firewall, um, having privileged access management, email filtering and validation, um, and end of life systems, making sure they're replaced. You don't have them sort of hanging out longer <laughs> than they're actually useful or, or viable within your organization. Next slide, please. So the, the the finish line is not getting the policy, uh, unfortunately. Uh, I think uh, you know everybody breathes a sigh of relief and okay, we've got coverage. It costs a lot more money, and we didn't get as much we wanted, but we're there. Um, that's only the first step because what we're also seeing within the carriers and they're they've got a business to run is because of the really unfavorable loss uh, ratios they've experienced over the last year or two. Uh, they're cutting costs any way they can. And um, what they're doing is, is uh, frankly, looking at the margins by saying, we can, we can ratchet down uh, the prices we pay to our vendors. Uh, so there, some of the vendors, particularly the forensic vendors, are feeling a lot of, of rate pressures. So you're going to maybe not get the A-team, depending on who you have for your forensic vendor. Um, and the same thing for, frankly, uh, panel counsel. 
Uh, what we're seeing now is the insurers are just saying, here, here's your, here's your normal panel counsel for whatever other kind of liability you might face. And, and like it or not, some of these, some of these panel counsel are not uh, cyber experts. Um, and what was interesting, we had a, a, a session of, a few weeks ago and we had a Q&A where two thirds of the audience said they didn't even know who their recommended vendors were under their policy, under their insurance policies. So uh, the, the watchword is, you know, don't wait till you've been hacked to meet your vendors. Um, and uh, Jennifer, maybe you wanna talk just a little bit about the potential for conflicts of interest and uh, the importance of master services agreements. Jennifer, are we, do we have you? You do have me and I put myself on mute because I just like to talk uh, so much. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I should put myself on mute. Um, well, you know, certainly uh, for the vendors and the master services agreements, one of the things that you want to ensure when you're hiring your vendors, you know, is to make sure that um, they do have and have adopted the protocols that you, in fact, do need in order to secure your data, but also to meet the um, uh, requirements of your carrier. I think that one of the issues with master services agreements is they are being rubber stamped. Uh, people aren't really looking at the language and then they're not studying, you know, which vendors uh, really need to do what, what do they need? How do they interact with us? How do they interact with the data? And it's just, it, it's just something that people know they have to put in. I think it's very critical that when you're looking at your master services agreements um, and you're looking at different vendors uh, that again, across the enterprise, that it is consistent with how you are answering, dealing with, and interrogating uh, these vendors and uh, what they offer to you. And so if, if you don't do that, um, if you don't have consistency, obviously you run the risk of your master services agreements saying different things for, for, for at different times. Um, and we want to avoid that as much as possible because again, consistency I think is key here um, and, and certainly having an enterprise-wide message. Um, I'd just like to add something, if I may. Um, with regard to your forensics vendors, um, one key component of your MSA is ensuring that you have a specific response time. And this is another benefit of getting to know those vendors in advance, right? If you retain the services of a forensic vendor um, before you have a breach, you, they can come out, they can meet your team, they can get to know, you know, how is your company structured? How's the network organized? You know, all of those details so that in you know, the heat of the moment when there's a, a true incident, they can just dive right in without all the preliminary details. And um, and with those MSAs, you know, very often there will be a retainer involved that you have to pay. But you know, with some of the larger forensics providers, they can guarantee like they are on site with you within, you know, less than 24 hours or, you know, and they can have someone on the phone with you who's your designated contact, um, you know, within an hour or two or whatever it may be. So that's really important um, to include that within those. Yeah, areas. that's a great point. And, and sometimes our clients say, well, why are we paying this large retainer? Uh, what if we don't need it? Well, two things, you get your phone call answered. Uh, and that, that may sound kind of cynical, but uh, it, it sometimes, and I've had this happen, where vendors have said, I can't help you. Uh, I'm, we're, we're over capacity and we're not taking any new business right now. Uh, so that's not a good place to be. Uh, so if you, I couldn't agree more with, with what Deb just said. It, it's it really, get that relationship established. And, and uh, if you have a, a, a retainer and you don't use it that year, they'll, they'll allow you other ways to, to work out for that retainer. Yeah. If, if we could have the next slide, please. Um, so I think it's worth re recognizing that you may not be able to get coverage. Uh, and this could be a, a, a very problematic circumstance because you may have obligations to your business partners or, or, uh, or to some of your vendors that you will have coverage. So what do you do? Um, I, I think uh, we're seeing because of the tight market, there are very good companies that cannot get coverage or they can't get coverage to the level that they have, they've committed to in their agreements with some of their business partners. And I think the, the way to deal with that is to be upfront 
uh, to be candid about it. Hey, this is what happened. Here's where we are. And then to be able, um, and I think Deb alluded to this earlier, be able to demonstrate your compliance, be able to say, we're not just paper compliance. Here's, here's how we live it. Um, and you might be able to get your broker to at least go to bat for you and explain to the, your business partner that, yeah, this, this is a very solid company, but um, it's a tough market. And sometimes you just can't get the coverage. Um, maybe segueing to the next slide, if we could, be, and there's a couple of other developments that I, it would be helpful just to touch base on uh, because this is not a static environment. And what we are seeing is uh, regulatory communities. Uh, I, I mentioned a couple here, uh, New York Department of Financial Services has had on the books for some time now uh, requirements that you provide notice to New York DFS if you're governed by DFS within 72 hours of suffering an incident. Now, th there's some uh, interpretation as to when that's triggered. There may be some materiality thresholds, et cetera. But the, this, is an, this is a strict liability provision. You don't have to uh, uh, be able to demonstrate that there was any harm from this. It's just you must, you must tell the New York DFS. And what they're doing is looking at some of the state uh, summaries of data breach notifications that come out every year. And they're looking at, at some of the entities that, they've got, that they govern and say, hmm, nobody ever told us about this. And they're going back um, a year or two after the fact and exacting very significant penalties, you, typically in the millions, even from smaller to medium-sized companies. Uh, and, and the other, I think, aggressive move we're seeing on how, how tight are these regulations going to be interpreted is uh, the European Data Protection Board has issued some guidance recently about what they consider to be appropriate interpretations of their laws, particularly the GDPR Article 33, which uh, is, is almost a default notification requirement. And uh, companies are, are more and more maybe exercising too much judgment in the uh, eyes of the supervisory authorities about not reporting immediately, which is a 72 hour uh, threshold as well with, with less interpretation allowed than New York DFS. Um, so if we could have the next slide, please. Um, in addition to these regulatory uh, developments, I think Deb's gonna talk about some, some other parallel developments in the regulatory community. Mm -hmm. Right. Thanks, Bob. So um, given that there's no national data protection authority in the U.S., the FTC sort of by default has assumed that role with regard to um, consumer personal data um, under their authority given by Section 5 of the FTC Act to regulate um, unfair and deceptive acts and practices in, in commerce. So several years ago, the FTC created a program they called Start With Security, and it was primarily focused on providing security guidance for small and medium-sized businesses. Um, they created a number of publications, and they actually went on a tour and, and did presentations about what is reasonable security. So a lot of those measures are very similar to um, the CIS um, critical security controls that top 20 list I mentioned. Uh, again, you know, they seem very basic and very obvious when you look at them, but actually doing them takes a lot of work for, for companies. And, um, you know, you really do need to dig in and do those. So I think that's a good resource. I, I send it out to clients all the time. It's sort of a good starting point if you don't know where to start. Um, and then also the FTC has brought numerous enforcement actions against companies that failed to implement reasonable security. You know, may have been deception under the FTC, um, deception prong if the company had a statement in their you know, privacy notice or elsewhere that said, you know, we protect your data with robust security and then they didn't actually have it. Or it might just be um, what the FTC considers inherently unfair practices by just having terrible security <laughs> measures, right? So there have been a number of these cases. I just listed four recent ones here. Um, I think these are some of the mo more recent. And there's really a trend in the FTC's um, enforcement actions and, and the orders that they issue as a result of these. Um, and they generally will require very common measures and often really even the exact language in uh, the orders issued to the different companies. So some of the commonalities include, uh, well, number one, prohibiting the company from future misrepresentations, but also mandating a written information security program, as I've already discussed, 
providing updates on the program to the company's board or somebody within the company who's a, a CISO or you know, otherwise tasked with heading up the security program and designating somebody qualified to be head of the program to you know, make sure those things get done. Assessing the program at least on an annual basis and after any data security incidents to determine if it still sufficiently addresses the risks that that company and its data might face to uh, design and implement and maintain safeguards and, and document those in policies and procedures with regard to security confidentiality and integrity of personal data. And also taking into consideration the volume of the data, the sensitivity, some of those other factors we discussed. Making sure um, there are inventories in place with regard to assets and personal information and deleting information when it's no longer necessary creating logs, monitoring the logs, um, looking at access to repositories of data, encrypting sensitive information um, when needed, training personnel, monitoring networks, testing and, and revising as needed you know, over time. A, a lot of these same common themes keep coming up. So those are what you should focus on. And, and then also, they also typically mandate third party audits um, on a periodic basis for all of these companies. Deb, let me ask you, sorry to interrupt, but um, the, the states have similar enforcement authority for unfair competition laws, et cetera. Are right. you seeing any, other than the, those states like Colorado that, that have empowered uh, the prosecutors to enforce some of these laws, are you seeing other movements in other states without similar privacy laws where the, the enforcement authorities are saying, we will proceed under unfair competition because, you know, for the same basis as the FTC does. I, mm -hmm. I've not seen too much of that, but I'm kind of curious if you're seeing any of it. Yeah, I, I know there have been cases, I can't think of any, you know, specific. Um, and then there's also litigation under some of those. Um, some, some of people, commentators call them the little FTC acts, right, that the states have. Um, so yeah, there, there's been quite a bit of litigation under those as well. And I think the states vary as to whether a private right of action is allowed or not, um, but certainly there's, there's action there. Yeah, um, and the point, sorry, the point being that you, many may think, well, the, the FTC is not going to mess with me. I'm just a little guy, mm -hmm. true enough. But I think we're seeing more and more interest at the state level for, mm -hmm. uh, in, for enforcing against companies that haven't really done the job they need to on security practices. But sorry okay. to interrupt, but I, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's very important. And, and also for a company that's not engaged in interstate commerce, um, if they're just in one state, um, that state certainly may be very interested, particularly if it's um, egregious misrepresentations or, you know, very um, you know, negligent practices with regard to sensitive data. Um, so the FTC also recently um, just updated the safeguards rule of the Graham Leach Bliley Act. So this is applicable to financial information of individuals individuals and, and um, the GLBA is for companies that engage in various different financial services. So I'm sure you know if you're subject to that law, but if you don't know, feel free to ask us. Um, so the, the safeguards rule was updated with more specific details. Again, over time, this all evolved. So such as uh, limiting who can access consumer data, using encryption to secure the data, requiring companies to explain their information sharing practices, and specifically the administrative, technical, and physical safeguards they use when sharing data, um, and requiring companies to designate a single qualified individual to oversee their information security program, report their details of their program and, and incidents to a board on a periodic basis. So if you're subject to the Graham Leach Bliley Act, definitely need to pay attention to all of that. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this is uh, a, a quick update uh, on why we're seeing this proliferation of ransomware. Uh, it's interesting, the, the, the criminal enterprises have now sort of uh, specialized in what it is that they do. Some are now making their money simply by selling the software for ransomware. Uh, so you, you, you find very unsophisticated criminals, they get the software and they say, well, this is, I can do this. 
so they're 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 hacking into companies, even though they're they don't have the a, a ton of expertise. Uh, and from the perspective of the software pro <laughs> provider, no one's it's 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 unlikely someone's going to going to prosecute somebody for providing for software that allows somebody else to hack in. Um, and so uh, it, it's interesting market segmentation. Uh, the other thing is people may know, but if not, it's important to understand not only is the, is the software available for criminals to, to use, but the, the dark web is now containing more and more for sale uh, uh, information about here, here's company ABC, and here are some of the, we've done a scan and here are some of their vulnerabilities and we'll sell them to you if you pay us X dollars. And so they can, you, if, if you're an enterprising criminal, I hope we have none in the audience, um, uh, you, can get, you can get the software and you can get the target on the dark web. So um, that's why I think we're seeing the, more and more of these uh, attacks. If we could have the next slide, please. Uh, so Jennifer, maybe you want to chat a little bit about you know what what happens um, when you're hacked and and how this dynamic is working with the 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 counterpoint of well we've got our data backed up. Um, you know the concept of double extortion I think is um, a really good one. Um, and when you think about the fact that these uh, ransomware payments have increased um, in Q3 2019 even by 33%, um, you, you do need to think of it more in terms of an extortion. Um, but more companies do have backup uh, capabilities for data such that it's really, um, it used to be that someone could hack into your system and hold all of your data and you would have not have access to it for X amount of time, or you know, they'd put it somewhere, et cetera. But now, um, you know, more and more companies have that backup uh, copy where they're not necessarily um, hamstring um, by by a breach. Um, the increasing trend right now is that you don't necessarily have to pay, well, you're not paying the ransom, but that really is reliant on the fact that you do have these backup, this backup data, you have a plan in place, you have a way to respond. Um, and, and therefore, you know, it, it's not always um, imperative that that ransom be paid. Although obviously there are circumstances in which the ransom does in fact need to be paid. Um, the hacker response to release the data, um, you don't need to show actual harm, I think, with statutory damages. Um, and if PII is involved, it could trigger CCPA exposure. And so one of the things that you, you do need to consider is, and I think there's this uh, later in the presentation, but also exposure and how you're reporting and what do you need to report. And I know that Bob's going to discuss that a little bit uh, further into our presentation. Um, if the data is released and there is PII involved and it triggers CCPA or um, another privacy act, um, you do need to consider how you will, how you're going to report that and if it's necessary to report it and how you are going to um, let those individuals know. Um, and then what your exposure is uh, for that. Um, finally, extorting your business partners. Um, highly sensitive information can be used as leverage, uh, certainly with customers. And um, hackers sometimes are contacting our customers directly with proof, essentially, that we have your data um, and we want the ransom uh, from you rather than the uh, original place that they've hacked. Um, and so, again, I think that when we are thinking about our vendor agreements, when we're thinking about our privacy policies and, and what we're informing our customers of, um, I think it's essential to remember that this next step is now happening with hackers, that they are co uh, contacting our our customers directly and therefore there is yet another uh, place of exposure. And just to add to that briefly, you know, Jennifer talked a little bit ago about the importance of these tabletop exercises. So it's not just to connect the dots, uh, very straightforward here. There, there are so many permutations now that these hacks can and do take uh, so that not only do you have to think about, well, wh what do we do if we have ransomware locking up our systems? You have to understand how how long will it take us to under to know whether or not our backups are available or are they as well encrypted? And then um, the the scenario of of a company saying I'm not paying, it's just wrong. And then they get a call from their customer 
whose information is contained in their system. And the, and the customer says, hey, I was just been contacted by the hacker and they're going to release this. I don't want that to happen. It could complicate matters in a, in a hurry. So the, the tabletop exercise, we can't, we can't stress them enough. Um, and then if we could have the next slide, please. Um, I, I do think it's, it's important to know that um, it is no longer axiomatic that if you have been hacked, you should just call up everybody and say, we've been hacked uh, because there may or may not be triggered obligations to notify. Uh, there is increasingly uh, detection capabilities are allowing companies to interrupt midstream these hacks. And so you may say, well, we got them. So there's no problem we're gonna have to report. It's really critical to understand that state laws are all over the map on this. Some, some may say, if there's no risk of harm, you don't have to report. There's about 20, 25 states that say that. Uh, some say, well, you have to acquire exfiltration versus just, just look at it. But some states say just a uh, uh, risk of harm analysis and access uh, uh, will, will be allowed. And so uh, the, the last thing to note as uh, these tabletop exercises need to get you know, extremely uh, granular is sometimes the forensic vendors will say, it's gonna be three days, four days before we even know what has happened. And your business partners expect to be notified in advance, well in advance of that. So if we could have the, the next slide, please. Um, as, as I think Austin alluded earlier, um, we wanted to just alert you to some of the some of the developments in the in state law litigation. Um, we've talked about uh, BIPA, which is uh, somewhat uh, now uh, ubiquitous in in terms of the litigation that is being pursued by any uh, company, even if they're not in Illinois uh, against any company. Uh, there was, as some of you may know, but it's worth noting because I think there was a hope that maybe the workers' comp laws would preempt BIPA for employees in circumstances. And typically the BIPA lawsuits are, are advanced in an employment relationship. Uh, but the uh, Illinois Supreme Court recently ruled that no, that there is no preemption. So what we're seeing now is um, if anybody has used biometrics uh, in an employment setting and you haven't jumped through the appropriate hoops under BIPA, gotten the consents, made the disclosures, et cetera, uh, you're, it is almost a, a certainty that, that that company will get sued. There are no defenses. And uh, as we uh, litigate these cases, uh, most often the only issue is how much you have to pay and not if. Uh, so the plaintiff's bar is getting emboldened. They've, they've got war chests. Uh, they've, they've cashed in on this. So now the question is, is where, where else are we going? And I wanted to just uh, leave you with some thoughts of, to, be, to be aware of as for those of you that do have any biometrics, even if you think we're on the, we're on the safe side of this, um, we're seeing more and more imaginative interpretations of BIPA by plaintiff's lawyers where companies are actually having to, to choose between, it's gonna cost me a big, a big number to defend against this, even though I don't think it's covered by BIPA. And the, uh, so what, for those that have any biometrics um, as part of their either business uh, relationships or employment relationships, uh, and, and you think you might be on the safe side of BIPA, I think it's, it's uh, maybe helpful to take another look at that. And I think we're all probably aware of the Texas Attorney General's recent enforcement action, um, which is, um, you know, I, I think uh, facial recognition uh, is, is going to be with us for a while, and it's ubiquitous in, in many of the applications. And so the, the contours of that have, have yet to be determined. Um, so where, where, does it, where, where are we going to go in the future? My, always a dangerous uh, exercise to predict the future, but here, here it is. The, the, the pushback against BIPA by Illinois businesses is, is significant. I don't know that that law will get rolled back, but as we see other laws um, in other states being privacy laws being debated and considered by legislators, uh, I think more and more the, the notion that there should be private rights of action is becoming sort of the limit. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll give you privacy, but we're not gonna allow private rights of action and we'll, we'll trust our prosecutors. So with that prediction of the future, Jamie, I'll turn it back to you to, to wrap up here. 
Well, thanks so much, Bob and Deb and Jennifer. That was really great. And I, I want to thank all the speakers for their um, insights today and also thank everybody who attended. Um, obviously, there's so much going on in all these areas and we're hoping that this will help you prioritize what you're going to work on. Um, there's a lot and probably a prioritized list and then seeking to continuously improve is the most realistic approach. It's not going to be, um, we're not going to be able to fix all of this in you know a month or something. This is going to be an ongoing process for companies. And as you can see, we've got developments um, in several U.S. states, in China, in the EU, and um, we're likely to see more. We're likely to see more cases decided in the EU, more state laws in the U.S. Um, these new, the California agency is going to come online and start enforcing. Um, so it's more to come. And um, thanks for your attention today. We will be sending out the survey and a checklist, as I mentioned earlier, that is intended to encompass the big points we raised today to help you kind of go through and assess for your company. So thanks so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. We're signing off.